Hello, good afternoon. Simha Yitz, do I you? No ops be hanak, Stawatogu. Get lands and jan, Dawawatku. Low Ryan was no you. Low Ryan Bilham Nah was no you. My name is Simha Yetsk. Um, I'm from the Gitlan tribe of Simshan. And I told you that my mother is um, Low Ryan. We follow our mothers in matrilineal descent um, for the Simshan. So thank you all being here. Uh, thank you for acknowledging the Musqueam territory. I appreciate that. And what I'm hoping to share with you today is a perspective of, of uh, how an Aboriginal viewpoint um, is within the forest. And we certainly can't cover everything. Um, it, would, it takes a lifetime to learn the forest, but this is just um, to get an idea of what it is that we're talking about when we talk about relationships with the forest. It's really um, important on this day of cultural diversity to acknowledge that we have many cultures around the world. And it's, um, it's an amazing honor to be able to, to describe to you some elements of culture. It's not all culture. Um, I have authority to speak about my culture. And I, I know that there are many other cultures around the world. Um, so I, I think it's, um, this is a good day for us to celebrate this diversity we have among people around the world. So when, when we talk about salmon berries in, in the Northwest, we're talking about a food that's, that's almost sacred. Um, salmon berries are, they're just, absolutely delicious, as you could see in the picture, right, the handful of berries, you just want to go pop them in your mouth. And there are, um, a, there are tons of stories up and down the coast um, in the salmon forest region um, that salmon berries occur about salmon berries. And I can't cover all of those today either. Um, so, and, and, but let's just go ahead and have a look at the forest and some different perspectives about um, how we learn of the forest and what we know about it. So um, I was really hoping and I tried all morning to try and get a soundtrack to play with some birds in the background as, as we took our journey on this walk through the forest. But um, I don't quite have this sophisticated technology at my disposal right now. So. <laughs> We'll just have to imagine that we hear birds singing in the forest as we're walking on this trail. This happens to be in Stanley Park, this particular trail. And Professor Samard and I have done some um, events with the TED um, patrons when they're in Vancouver. We have um, for a few years given um, a couple of seminars during each week period about uh, forest ecology and Aboriginal knowledge. And we go through down the trails of this um, of, of Stanley Park and, and describe these things. And um, one, the first time that we actually went out there and did a reconnaissance, this is a little salmonberry story. Uh, we um, came across some salmonberry brambles, and there were some holes that were kind of in the brambles. And I said, "Oh, look, a bear path." And Suzanne says. What? What do you mean? And I said, well, it's probably not a real bear path, but if we we're up on the central coast um, and we saw this, then we would know that it's a real bear path. But since we're in Vancouver, then it's probably not a real bear path per se, but this is what they look like. They go, you know, the salmonberry bushes that are at the edge of the stream have holes in them and that's where bears go through. And so, oh, she didn't know that. And so we go up, we happened to go up to the Central Coast that year uh, to Bella Bella, the Hiltzik territory, and helping a, a student set up his uh, transects to study um, relationships of salmon and forests. And um, we got to a point where we're describing the 90 degree, you know, um, angle to veer off and start setting his plots. And, and we happened to be at an area that was had salmonberry 
brambles. And she says, well, now what? And I said, think like a bear. She says, oh, good idea. And off she goes into the salmonberry bushes. And I'm like, no, there's bears here. There really are bears here. <laughs> it, it didn't stop us. We went in and um, the bears must have heard us coming because they all scattered. We didn't see any bears. But it's an entertaining story that, that we like to tell about our salmonberry bushes out in, in Stanley Park and on the Central Coast. Many people know us as the people of the Cedar, the uh, indigenous people of the Pacific Northwest. Um, that's because Cedar is it's the tree of life. It means everything to, um, it, it provides everything for indigenous people on this coast. Um, it's what the houses were made out of. It's what clothing is made out of. Um, and we, we cherish Sister Cedar and provide respect to her um, when we're going to use the tree. And different groups have different protocols for addressing um, the cedar tree. And in Simshan, we acknowledge um, her if we're going to, to gather some bark from her, for example, as these pictures depict. Um, I would go up and acknowledge her and thank her for her life. And then um, respectfully take the, the cedar, cedar bark and but only a, a certain amount, a small amount, so that it it won't kill the tree. Um, it does harm the tree, but the tree will will try and heal around that wound like a burl, and it'll take a hundred years for it to close off and seal itself, and then it may not be harvested again. But it might be a hundred years from now. Who knows, right? Um, but this is, this is what the tree looks like after it's been harvested for cedar bark. Um, and it's the phloem, actually, the phloem part of the tree and not, not the cambium. Um, it's the phloem part that we use. And we um, might use the outer bark, we might use the inner bark. And they were also used for our, what's known as totem poles um, or house posts and, and uh, story poles, et cetera. This is at the University of British Columbia Museum of Anthropology. It's in the, the back of the building, in the back of the lot. And I like this photo because it does depict, you know, it's a, it's a depiction of what a Haida village might have looked like prior to changes on the coast. And what we see is the, um, there was a, a good use of shells of, on the pathways. Of, of in front of this that would have actually occurred coastwide um, with shell remains as a, kind of a almost a landscaping method, right? You think of it, but it was actually to help um, light up the trails at darkness because they they shine brighter um, when they're lit up with with the, the light colored shells. This is one of the baskets that I made uh, myself. My mother has taught me in our tradition, our Simshan tradition, and this is entirely made out of the inner cedar bark um, of the tree. So the piece that I pulled off, I would take the outer bark off on the outside and then would have just the inner bark and um, then would prepare that in certain ways in order to get the one quarter inch width and just the right thickness in order to use the materials to make a basket such as this. And um, this diagonal weave basket um, is a challenge. It's a huge challenge to make these baskets. Um, you'll notice that there's no design on the inside of that basket. So it's, it's quite uh, um, technical to actually construct a basket and um, takes some mathematical skills as well as some creativity. Here's another basket that has a berry design on it. Um, I was searching and searching and searching to find a basket that had a salmonberry design on it because we do have a salmonberry design, but um, I wasn't, I was unsuccessful. And then also realized that the one that came to mind is actually one that I'm making right now. <laughs> so, not quite ready. This is another basket that's, um, it's a bent bark basket. It's made out of one piece of cedar bark. 
but on the sides, um, well, it's carved in certain dimensions, and then it's steam bent up. So then it folds like an envelope, right? Um, on the sides is wild cherry bark and um, spruce root or cedar root, but this looks like spruce root on my, I made this basket. And then the top is an inner cedar bark band. So the same material on the two baskets that you just saw, it's the inner bark. And the, the darker color is the outer bark. So it's that piece is all inner bark and outer bark still together. But it's these other things that we add onto baskets and things that we use for ornaments like this is a particular grass plant. These are critically important to uh, provide stewardship in the forests where they grow so that we can use them for basket weaving materials. And we keep track of where things are, where the highest quality materials are growing and we try to make sure that they're relatively protected. It's, it's very difficult now that we have different management scenarios in our forests. So, um, but we still have that interest in making sure that we've got the high quality we're looking for in materials. And quite honestly, our cedar is, is disappearing and um, the quality is deteriorating. So let's talk a little bit more about indigenous people around the world. There are 400 million plus people that are associated with about 5,000 tribes located in 90 countries. And that's about 6% of the human population around the whole planet. But that 6% represents 90% of what we know as cultural diversity. And that's, that's all of the people around the world. So out of these indigenous people, the remaining portion of their lands is about 20% of our land mass. And we're actually seeing 80% of our biodiversity remains in those lands. And it's because they're protected. In one part, some of these areas are protected for the use of the indigenous people. Such as in Canada, we have reserves, right? We have protected areas. And Canada is working towards indigenous conserved protected areas as well. Those are still in development. In the United States, there are reservations that have very large scales of, there are large scale areas that are reserved for tribes, um, very large areas. So there's, there's protected areas. And so we see a benefit of those, those protections for increasing biodiversity. But it's also what indigenous people do with these lands. And I'm gonna give you some more examples um, about the stewardship practices. We see, and then in my research, I found that our social institutions that we have in our Aboriginal worlds are um, on, this, on the Pacific Northwest coast, where they facilitated um, increasing production or productivity of natural resources by the way that these resources were being used. It wasn't simply a matter of taking from the resources, but it was actually thought in terms of giving to the resources. Just like I give a prayer to Sister Cedar when I'm going to take a piece of, of her bark. It's providing that reciprocity, the respect and the generosity so that they continue in the future. And this is really important when we're thinking about the forest and, and how we belong to this place. Whoops, wrong way, sorry. Biodiversity is something that we celebrate. This is known as, um, this is Kwakwakiwak, so it's not a Simshan tradition, it's Kwakwakiwak. And it's um, known as opening a box of treasures. And this box of treasures contains masks of things that are used in the environment. And, and it's celebrated. So this box of treasures is opened up at a feast or also known as a potlatch. And that's one of the social institutions that I'm referring to that actually facilitates a stewardship and increasing productivity. And I wrote about that in my dissertation. Um, another um, element that we're recognized for is the reciprocity, right? Um, 
when and when you it's when you give there is something that returns to you it's not a matter of give and take it's that's not the appropriate way to think about it it's just about a generosity of giving it's the reciprocity comes back and this picture by my friend robert hewson this um, image is about the belief of the simshan that when we return the salmon to the water after we have eaten the salmon then the bones will transform back into a salmon again and they will return to their village under the sea that has chiefs and all the other salmon people that are there and so and we you know this is was a, a habitual practice about returning the bones back and some first salmon ceremonies also to do that as a function, but it's it's not practiced the way that it used to be. The philosophy still remains, the connection and the reciprocity still remains, and the understanding that salmon do return to their villages in the sea is an important concept in how we understand the ocean life history of salmon. There's another little fish, though, that might mean more to us on this coast. And it's the ulican. It's a small snout-like fish, and it's, it has a very high oil content. And we extract the oil out of it for a product that we call grease. And that grease we actually use as a condiment on other foods, and such as dried fish or um, a barbecued salmon or something. Um, we'll use it on on everything. Um, it has had been used in the past and still is used to preserve dried fish and um, it's actually even been used in in the past history for things like um, greasing uh, logging skids to get trees off the mountain so um, it has been extensively used and this little fish is actually in trouble um, throughout its range it's got a declining uh, productivity right now but this little fish is so important to us that when we're watching for signals in the environment, one of them is related to salmonberry. And this is a really important salmonberry story for me. What you're looking at here is what we call oilf. Oilf. I tried to get Suzanne to say that and it just didn't happen. And quite frankly, or, or honestly, um, our uh, film documentary and actually caught that on film. So you might see it on a screen one day, um, trying to teach her how to say oil. This is a really interesting um, concept. When this, you know, we come out of winter and the snow is melting and well, it stops snowing first, and then the snow is melting and the ice is melting on the rivers up north. But the plants start to emerge and they, you know, they start spreading. And this is what we're seeing right now at the month of May in, in most areas. We're seeing the new growth has unfurled. Leaves are starting to flap on the trees. You know, they're completely open. And um, what we're looking at here is salmonberry branches that are new growth for the year. So they've come up and unfurled and they've grown. It's a delicacy for children to go out and pick these in, in the forest when, they've, when they're fresh like this and then dip them in sugar and just eat them. It's high in vitamin C, it's nutrition, it's very nutritious. And what it's doing is um, actually pruning the plant just like you would prune plants in your own yard for various reasons. This is a, a way to prune the plants and causes them to put more of their energy into their blossoms, right? The next phase of their life cycle, the blossoms and then the fruit. So we end up having this much more robust fruit along the way. And but those blossoms, we're really happy to see those blossoms first because what that tells us is that um, there's going to be food for the bugs the macroinvertebrates that are going to come along and there'll be some there'll be some nectar in those blossoms for those bugs and that's good because we want the bugs to be healthy because in the water 
there's juvenile Chinook salmon that are in there and they're hungry. They're starting to eat now. And so they're looking at um, their food sources and bugs is top of their list. So if we've got good, healthy salmonberry blossoms that are attracting good, healthy bugs, then we know that our juvenile Chinook salmon are gonna have good food source. And we want them to have that food source instead of the ulican larvae that have emerged at the same time. And because if there isn't any bugs on for the salmon to eat, they will eat the oolican larvae. And that's um, detrimental to the survival of oolican. So we need to have these riparian plants healthy in the forest. There is this strong relationship between the terrestrial and the aquatic systems. And this is something that we're studying in the mother tree project project is these connections. Suzanne Samard started this with a strategic project grant and under NSERC um, in 2015, I believe it was. The Mother Tree Project is about, just real briefly, it looks at different ways of uh, managing the harvest of forests in treatments, five treatments at three sites at at least 21 locations throughout the interior Douglas fir in, inter in interior British Columbia. Plus uh, we have a site on um, at Malcolm Knapp. So we have one coastal and our hope is to set up um, three more coastal sites within this next year. Um, so incorporating a, possibly instead of the Douglas fir, which doesn't grow much past here as far as a, a dominant forest, um, cedar and, and spruce. So, um, but the mother tree project looks at the dominant tree in the forest, which for example, you would see in this picture here, this cedar, and the relationship to the trees around it and the plants. There are things going on below ground with these trees that are transferring nutrients um, among the mycorrhizal networks. So the mycorrhiza is fungus root. It's the association of the fungus that's below ground in the soils and their attachment to the roots of trees. And they exchange nutrients at this interface. Um, and we've known as you know, indigenous people about these types of connections for forever. And we have probably con been conveying information about these connections but not being listened to up until the most recent past. Um, the late Bruce Miller of the Skokomish tribe would talk about, um, his Subie is his name, and he would talk about the tree people. Remember I talked about the salmon people? Well there's tree people too. And Subie would talk about how the tree people have so much to teach us about their diversity and the symbiotic nature of things going on in the forest. And that the way that things are connected below ground actually gives the strength and the cohesiveness to the community, like our community. So it provides us that example, the living example for us to emulate in our own communities and showing the roles that we each have as a member. And when we're working together, then we're all much stronger. So Suzanne has a book, it's just been released um, on May 4th, Finding the Mother Trees. I highly encourage um, looking up that book um, <clears throat> for a, a read about how she explored the forest and her career in looking for the mother tree. This is really important in British Columbia, particularly at this moment in time when the provincial government is contemplating destroying the last of the old growth forests. I, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about that, but I think it's really important to bring it to the attention of, of everybody that's, that would be interested that the future of forests in British Columbia are at risk. And here's an example to show you what has happened on a transformed landscape. This is a Douglas Lake and this is a Google map picture, Google Earth picture from 1984. And you can see quite a bit of green. You do see in some areas where you've got uh, treatments of, of harvest 
along the way. But now this is tragic. This is what it looks like in 2018. So here again, 1984, and here we are in 2018. And we've got some severe consequences as a result of this type of change happening in the species populations that rely on these forests, whether they're four-legged, two-legged, or swimming. We're seeing declines in species abundance, and we're seeing declines in biodiversity. And that's a problem. So we have to do things better. Another project that I work on is the salmon forest. And now if you look at this map, wherever you see, you see the bright green, that shows some, some good salmon or good forested areas, but all of the areas that are actually colored is sal where salmon occur. All the way up from California, low parts of California, there used to be a lot of salmon in here, they're struggling there, going and they're starting to, uh, as you go north along the coast, you see declining abundances. The Columbia River is missing a few stocks. Puget Sound is missing a few stocks. Fraser River has had 16 Chinook stocks recently evaluated and at risk. Eight of them are endangered. And then you keep going up north and we're starting to see declines up in Alaska as well, where they thought they would never have a decline in salmon. And we know that we were missing some Chinook in the Yukon. This, their salmon forests are starting to look bleak without their salmon. So this is a huge area. Wherever we have these forests, we have salmon and things that we're doing with forests and the climate that's impacting it as well are having impacts on our salmon populations. So the salmon forest and these relationships affect other species as well. This is a Kermode bear, Muscum all, um, we call Kermode bear. And Kermode is not a native name. Muscum all is Simshan uh, name for this bear. And it's a black bear actually uh, with a um, recessive gene expression for the white. Um, there's a story about that too, but let's, let's keep going here. This bear, <clears throat> remember the salmonberry path that in Stanley Park? And I said, there's a, there's a hole, that's a, that's a bear path. Well, this bear has gone through a bear path from a stream and taken its salmon up to its favorite place to eat. This bear is only gonna eat the choice parts, the favorite parts, they're picky eaters. They'll only eat their most favorite parts and then they'll walk away, they'll go back to the stream and get another one so they can eat just their favorite parts. And the rest of it's left to decay. Some other critters are gonna come along, of course, and take a snack. Even little wrens in the forest will feast on the remains of the carcass that the bear and the wolves will leave. A wolf will take a salmon into the forest and eat the brains. Any other part of the salmon might give it worms. So it's just gonna eat the brains. The rest of it decays into the forest. And after all the other animals have had their share, what's remaining goes into the soils. And we see this with piles of salmon bones in the forest at these bare bench sites where it's next to a great big huge mother tree, a dominant tree. And there's, there's fins, uh, pieces that we see in this picture, and, and there's a little fungi that's starting to grow. And so this, the relationships are really complex. And one is feeding the other. We've got what we have is a complex adaptive system in these forests and how the nutrients are feeding into the health of the forest, which in turn feeds the health of the species dependent on the forest. One of the things that I'm hoping to do with our salmon forest project is to reinvigorate some of our Aboriginal technology. What you're looking at here is known as a salmon tidal stone trap. It's built by indigenous people up and down this coast, they would use a variety of different uh, technologies to capture salmon. On the central um, coast of British Columbia and northwards, we see a lot of stone trap features. When the tide comes in, it inundates this wall that's been built 
and the salmon won't see it and can swim right over it at high tide and then go up into their stream, which in this particular picture is over on this side. So, and then the tide goes back out and then it comes back in and it goes way out. And when it goes way out, there are salmon that are gonna be entrapped in a pool here. And we could just walk in and pick up our preferred selection of the day. It's the most efficient passive technology that there must be ever devised. And we could also leave the largest salmon there. We would leave it there. And the reason that we would leave it there is because we would want that fish to go up and spawn. If we have a larger female salmon going up to spawn, she has a higher fecundity. So she has more egg in her belly, a higher fecundity. And that means that she's going to have more salmon. And if we've allowed both large female and large males, then those eggs are going to be <clears throat> the offspring of two large fish, which is going to produce more large fish. And what we're seeing coastwide right now, <clears throat> excuse me, coastwide right now, we're seeing a decline in salmon populations. <clears throat> and with Chinook, we're seeing a decline coastwide in size. And it's because nobody is managing like this anymore. No, but we were, Aboriginal people were pulled away from our management techniques. And it turns out that there's some cost to that. <clears throat> Opportunity costs from pulling us away from, from the way that we provided stewardship to our resources. So we had been doing this for thousands of years. And there's these relationships with the forest that were also dependent on nutrient delivery of salmon for thousands of years that has been disrupted. And we have a window of time right now that we can actually maybe grab a hold of some of that and restore some of it. We also use, um, remember the little fish ulican? These are part of our traditional medicines. And this is another story with the, the salmon berries. <clears throat> um, the oil provide, with, provide us with vitamin C, right? A lot of vitamin C. But there's a lot of other plants that are used as food sources in the forest. And we're starting to lose those as well because of the way that um, the forest has, uh, the forest management has changed. Um, so we use some other um, animals, mammals, bears, seals, and the oil from those as well, but not as great quantities as we would use our fish and, and seal oil. So here's some examples of, um, tree, of plants that we see in the forest or walking, right? You, lots of people know what devil's club is. You wanna avoid getting the thorns in your, in your hands, right? Um, but if we would actually provide some stewardship to make sure that areas um, that had these plants were well taken care of. Uh, nettles are another thing. Uh, stinging nettles, something you don't want to touch, right? But nettles, the fibers inside the nettles were used to make fishing nets um, along with cedar. And um, so we would find, you know, these um, thickets that would be protected um, so that there wouldn't be any harm to come to them. So they would continue to provide these products that we relied on. And of course, then there's a lot of things that we eat um, and drink like Hudson's Bay tea, but you wanna make sure you know what you're picking if you're gonna be picking in the forest. I highly encourage you to double check. Don't go out into the forest and try things haphazardly or randomly. It could be very dangerous. Um, here's a couple of books to get to know what Aboriginal people use for food from the forests. Uh, Nancy Turner has written both of these. She was a, a professor um, at University of Victoria. Uh, my friend Nancy, these are great books. So I think um, this is Ed Carrier, a member of the Suquamish tribe. Um, and he has a lot of stories um, about 
our use of the environment as well. Um, and he's you know, a great teacher of basketry skills. I think I've got, yeah. So, you know, we, we hear things like, uh, you know, that science is catching up to <laughs> indigenous knowledge sources. And I would have to caution you that science has a long ways to go <laughs> to catch up to indigenous knowledge. You know, and I've given you an example of the Pacific Northwest and how we apply some of our knowledge and what the benefits of those are. There are similar types of knowledge systems in other areas of the world. And it's those cultures that should be protected because they have information about our life here on this planet and how it is how to protect that life, how to cherish it and make sure that we're looking after the very life support system that we all depend on.